Sunday in Lagos and it's standing room only at the suburban Hope Hall. The charismatic church is booming in every corner of Nigeria's commercial capital. Here, it's the redeemed Christian Church of God that's leading the way. It's hardly surprising they're looking to the heavens for answers because they're certainly not getting any on the ground. And for these people, nothing short of divine intervention is going to change that. People are suffering for God's sake. It's not easy. People are really, really suffering. In this most bountiful oil-producing nation, Nigerians must wait in long queues for overpriced and often imported fuel. Oil is conflict, oil is war, oil is division, oil is destruction. In the country's south, oil pollution ravages fishing grounds in the mighty Niger Delta. Villagers say they're dying from strange new illnesses. And children learn maths on a dirt floor. And that as foreign companies pump enormous natural wealth out from beneath their feet. Nigerians have come to expect nothing from their politicians, save self-interest, corruption, upheaval, and more often than not, a leader who wears a soldier's uniform. And that includes this man, Olusegun Obasanjo. 20 years ago, he ruled Nigeria as a military man. Retired from the army and repackaged, He's just been elected president in an intensely scrutinized popular vote. Nigerians desperate for a future have gone back in time. But that's the way it is in this deeply troubled, densely populated black nation that straddles a great and ancient divide. In the far north, just shy of the Sahara Desert, Kanu is one of Nigeria's oldest cities. Here, the rituals and traditions of a different age continue to thrive. Kanu is the historic home of powerful dynasties that to this day wield enormous influence in Nigeria. It's political and economic clout that's brought the North more than its fair share and driven a wedge deep into Nigerian society. heading traditional institutions, an institution that is about the most powerful institution in the country. They love him, they respect him, they revere him.
Emir al Haji Ado Bayero enjoys the unwavering loyalty of his people, just as Muslim chiefs here have done for centuries. As he rides through Kanu, the reverence is profound. All along the way, townsfolk stop to pay their respects to the Emir. It's a parade fit for royalty. They see themselves as fathers of all. The Emir in the past, especially during the colonial days, he was the sole native authority. He had control over the police, the prisons, the judiciary. He was in charge of all the land. He allocated the land to whom he wanted. So he was everything. With the coming of politics, all these powers were taken away from him, from the Emir. And yet he is clearly powerful. This is the Emir's court, an extraordinary sight. Villagers come here with their grievances and supplicate themselves, seeking the Emir's judgment. This group has come with a property dispute. They accuse their local chief, he's the one in the middle, of swindling some land. The Emir suspends him from office, effective immediately. Appeals to a civilian court are rare. And I think it is a beautiful arrangement. If you have any misunderstanding or any quarrel between sections, then the Emir can come in and he will be listened to with respect. Few know more about the enormous implied power of the Islamic chiefs than Yusuf Maitama Sule. Nigeria's former ambassador to the United Nations counts the Emir of Kanu as a close friend and concedes that those with an eye to ruling this country, civilian or soldier, need the solid support of these northern clerics. But the military just came in. They are not elected. They want the support of the people. The military oosted the civilian politicians. The only institution that can get support for them from the public is the traditional institution, the MS. So is it fair to say then that the emirs are more powerful under a military government? Yes, I must say this. <coughs> and perhaps that's why a former military man fared so well here in Nigeria's presidential poll. The emir and his council of advisers didn't explicitly endorse General Obasanjo, but that he won an overwhelming majority of the vote in the north says a lot about the public perception of old alliances. It's the great Nigerian paradox that its arid, resourceless north enjoys wealth, stability and the patronage of government when those who live right on top of Nigeria's riches enjoy next to none of it. In the south, the mighty Niger River dislocates into a vast delta, and at almost every turn, there's a sign of the epic wealth below, a resource so rich, a fortune could flow to every Nigerian door. But of course, it doesn't. The oil, rather than being a blessing, is a curse. And the local people are disempowered, and they cannot stop the oil companies from doing what they want. I'm traveling with activist Aronto Douglas into the heart of the Delta, the oil fields of Nigeria. Here lies 95% of the country's wealth and foreign companies are pumping it out at the rate of two million barrels a day. It's a bonanza for companies like Shell and Chevron, 
and of course the Nigerian government, which takes a half share. But it's a blight on local villages like this one, Batan. So how often does the company representatives come here? Any time they think there's trouble. Yeah. When there's no trouble, they don't come. Okay. You know, and they, the community always asks for these amenities. We cannot go. Jerry, Jerry. Yeah, you was four. Four. Clap yourself. The villagers of Batan say they scratch together a pittance to establish this classroom, but there's no power and no health care. They claim pollution is killing their fish, poisoning their food, and that it's brought deadly illnesses. They are fishermen and farmers. Look at our mothers, our, our fathers. They go into the river to look for fish. They go into the farm to try to get food. But when they plant their crops, the crops no longer grow because it is polluted. They go into the water to catch their fish, and the fishes are not there. So there is, they are waging a violent and vicious ecological war on our people. They want us to die. That is, that is the, the basis. Now in Bataan and elsewhere across the oil grid, indigenous communities have had enough. A new militancy is emerging. They're simply turning off the oil at pumping stations like this one. They're wildcat hits that are draining the oil companies and the Nigerian government's coffers of millions of dollars. The people are not benefiting. And if the people are not benefiting from this oil, for Christ's sake, they should keep it for the people. So what's the situation with these boats here? When disputes emerge over pollution, they'll even commandeer a boat or two until the oil companies pay compensation. Last year, there was oil spillage. Two of them. Compensation was not duly paid. See, now they are looking up to Shell for reaction. But, again, but Shell says that they don't pay if, if, the, if the installation is sabotaged. No. no. The, 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 the spillage no, 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 no. last year was not uh, a judge sabotage. Shell acknowledged it, accepted it, that it was their mechanical yeah. failure. Yeah. So, The Niger Delta is at flashpoint. Sabotage, piracy, oil blockades. The rebellious villagers are out to force the giants like Shell and the Nigerian government to share the spoils. We believe that some of the things the community are asking us to do is what the government should be doing. Uh, so we don't believe that it's the development of the community or the area will be solely an oil, oil, oil company affair. How do you actually put it Hubert Nwokolo is a Shell executive who's feeling the heat in the Delta. But if the community comes and says, ah, the government should have paid us two million, with this oil belongs to us, that's a political issue. We have been shut down in some cases uh, because a local government headquarters has been moved to another place. That's a political issue. And therefore, we have nothing to do with that. If they insist that we stop production, we will stop production. And I don't see that as our problem. In reality, a shell shutdown and withdrawal is about as likely as a swift solution to this hard question of equity in the Delta. The anarchy here is only likely to build. We are saying we want to survive. The key issue here is survival, don't forget. Survival of a people. We have a right to survive. You pollute our air, you, 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 you destroy our waters, you pollute our land, and you want us to die? We can't. We will, we will have to struggle back. We will have to insist on survival. I am President General As a military leader, General Abbasinjo may have simply crushed the Delta uprising with brute force and terror. Now, as a reborn civilian leader, he's going to have to find a political solution. With a strident, newly assertive constituency, he'll need the wisdom of an emir and more than a little divine guidance to settle the most pressing problem facing his country, both north and south.
Nigerians, both Christians and Muslims, are the most religious people in the world. We believe in prayers. Today, if we are sensing any crisis, or if there is any problem in the country, or any crisis in the country, the authorities do not have to ask the people to go to the mosques and churches to pray. The people on their own will go to the mosques and churches and pray for peace. Pray for a solution to the problems facing us. If you believe.